Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer. And I'm Fiona Bennett. Really nice to be back with you on National Poetry Day. And we've got a really special episode for you this month featuring the fabulous actor Patterson Joseph. He's not just a fabulous actor, he's a fantastic man as, uh, as you're going to get to hear. We were at the October Gallery for this conversation, weren't we, Michael? Yeah, gorgeous space. I've never been there before. It's... How would you describe the October Gallery? I think I'd describe it as a hidden gem. It's a gallery with a very interesting and beautiful set of spaces. It makes itself a home to artists in various ways. And the Visual Art Gallery, which is downstairs, exhibits work by international artists from all over the world. I think in particular Africa and... South America. South America. Yeah, I think so. Patterson's going to be speaking about a poem called 5am by Roxy Dunn. I bumped into Roxy with Patterson a couple of weeks ago and it turns out that she had always been a big fan of the Poetry Exchange. She was kind of excited that she was going to be featured on the Poetry Exchange. So Roxy Dunn is a fantastic young poet, playwright, actor. It's great, I think, that we can kind of give a bit of a platform to a young emerging poet, you know, alongside the the Yates and the Karen Ann Duffys and the established kind of people. So it is National Poetry Day, and I thought I might ask you if there's a poem that you've come across recently that perhaps is going to become a new friend that you might want to talk about a little bit. Wow. I think I would have to say the poem that I feel I'm in the early stages. I've maybe had, you know, two of those kind of 1am putting the world to rights around the kitchen table kind of encounters with this possible new friend. Well, definite new friend, I would say, uh, which is a poem by a Greek poet called Kiki de Mula, and it's called The Wrong Arrangement. Great title. It's a fantastic title, isn't it? I already want to know more about it. Yeah, Yeah, well, I mean, I think maybe I should leave it there and people should find The Wrong Arrangement by Kiki de Mula. We'll put the details of that on the bit of info so you can find that poem. Mm. So I guess we should get to the main event. Yeah, and invite you to listen into this conversation about 5am by Roxy Dunn, the poem that's been a friend to Patterson. The poem I, I, that I have in mind is, is is one of her poems, but it isn't the poem itself. Because there are poems that I've known that have probably, if you like, affected me more in some way, or I've had to do with them because I've had to recite them or something. Yeah. But it's about the poet. It's about this poet. And, and she's a friend of mine. I didn't even know she was a poet. And then she sent me some of her poems. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to because I don't because I'm a bit like that with poetry. Like I'm dyslexic. I feel like I'm not, but I feel like I am. And I read hers, and I immediately my shoulders went down. I was like, I get this. I really get this, and I also think they're good. Is that a, is that possible? And yeah. and every time I read one of her poems, I always have the same reaction, which is a very Caribbean thing, and it's just a noise, and it is. Huh. <laughs> at the end of every single one and it's like I don't know how she does it to me because I feel like I know what this is going to be and then I uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but that is the feeling I get every time I read one of hers mm. so it's like a poet a poet who who has sort of awakened me to poetry and made me feel like I w- I'm welcome that's lovely I'm welcome in the poetry world have you got a copy? <laughs> I, I got it yeah. yes <laughs> <laughs> this has just been published this all uh, it's been published a while ago but uh, it's now available in foils I mean the actual poem is called 5am okay would you mind reading it out for us to just hear it yeah 5am it's not quite light am I getting old old people wake early half a croissant on the desk like a squashed crescent and there's that record I bought with the Soviet rocket sleeve around the corner in Highbury Keith's cat has given you fleas your bags are packed for Antibes 
I wonder if I care about the right things, like rabbits dying slowly and Brexit. Sometimes I'm secretly unfazed. I feel selfish and middle-aged. I'd like to play this rocket record, but I don't have a record player. The band are from Leeds, is that cool? I can't work out if this is a regret or just the onset of dullness. I think I'll eat breakfast and sleep till noon, eat the remains of last night's moon. <laughs> yeah. See, and again, I, I didn't see, almost didn't see this first or third, fourth time I read it, but it's like you're in bed with someone and are you regretting that you'll be, you're in bed with them? There's full thoughts pulling you away from whoever's been next to you that's got fleas from Keith's cat and you're sort of talking to them in your head. Yeah, it was that, that was what really came out actually when you read it was that you, the switch from I to you yeah. and then back again. That's a really, and the positioning of that. Yeah. That's a, in the second... It's the second verse, yeah. She just talked about the, oh, that album I bought yesterday. Around the corner in Highbury, Keith's cat has given you fleas. Your bags are packed for on Teebs. There's so much in there. Yeah. In what is, uh, as you say, it's kind of a, on, on the surface, it's just... It's a meandering thought. Yeah. But there's loads going on in there. Yeah. As well as this, you know, at the first reading, it's so pleasing, the, the rhyme of fleas and then teams. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's unexpected, yeah. That, that are really kind of joyful in that. It's, it's, I don't know, I find something very satisfying in that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but actually, there's a, there's a hell of a lot going on underneath it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that um, vulnerable place where you are first thing in the morning. Like I do these morning pages. I don't know if you've ever done that. I have, yeah. uh, from Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way. Or you get up and you just write the splurge for three pages. And yeah, it's like, my eyes are crusty. I don't write properly. Oh my God, I look dyslexic. What's this horrible writing? I hope nobody ever reads this. Oh, I hope my mum's gonna be okay. I do think about dying. And I do think about the fact that you're gonna fall off the edge of a sort of no conveyor belt. If your mum goes, then you're next, aren't you? You know, th that kind of, mundane, profound, mundane, profound thing that happens when you do morning pages because you're in that place where you're totally open mm -hmm. to whatever might come and that's the place where you're going to get that nugget of a genius thought or clarity about what you should really be doing, what you really want to do, which is maybe leave that person that I don't care enough about them. You realise profoundly as you see their sock hanging off the, the doorknob again. You know, and then you're thinking about your food, or you're thinking about. But that thought has made you go somewhere underneath you, underneath your consciousness. It's gone. You need to leave. That's the beauty of the work that she does. Is that mm. it, it, it's so surface. Some of it, so sort of observations of things that you can see. But she has that with this poem in particular ability to stand on the edge of super consciousness about things. And a playfulness, the playfulness as well. Mm. You know, that, you know, I think I'll eat breakfast, then sleep till noon, eat the remains of last night's moon. Do you think, uh, okay, that's moon, noon, moon, but actually that goes back to the crescent. That goes back to the croissant. These images are not, they're not, they're playful, but they're really meant. Mm. But it happened accidentally, it seems. Mm. as she was writing it. Was it actually, you know, that, I just love that. Like one of my favorite books is Blink, Malcolm Gladwell, about your first instinct. And your first instinct is often uh, disparaged. So in other words, oh, you feel this, and then you go, well, that's, that's wrong. I can't think that. I can't think that lustful thought. I can't think that crazy thought. I can't think that violent thought. But there is in us, all of those things, craziness, violence, lust, and we censor ourselves the whole time because we're afraid of the bone that's gonna drop out of our mouth and we go, you actually think that? Mm. Well, no, but sometimes it will occur to me and it's okay. Mm. It's in, and that's the thing, the great thing I suppose about good poetry is it's a flow of thought, sometimes non sequiturs, don't feel like they add up, but at the end, they pack a punch because they've, dismantled you. Mm. They've 
disarmed you because you weren't expecting that yeah. and so suddenly now you're open and it stabbed you yeah. you were laughing a second ago and now you're crying why yeah. am i crying yeah. she does that thing of judging herself here or judging her thoughts doesn't she where she says I, I wonder if i care about the right things like rabbits dying slowly and brexit well i'm really identified with that yeah that's another do, one of those do you have that thing where you kind of you know <laughs> you kind of get sort of overwhelmed by the things I feel I ought to care about. Yes. And you start, I haven't got time to care about. There's too many awful things. And actually, I can't live in a place where I'm giving my heart and soul to all these awful things happening around the world. On some level, I, I, I would quite like to buy that shirt. Yeah. And you feel really shallow. Yes. You know. Yes. But I, I, I find that. I kind of, you know, I judge myself for, for that stuff. It is, uh, as, as uh, neurologists will tell us, the thing about old age, older age, middle age certainly, is that you do slough off all these things that you know are not going to be important to you, or you've decided are not important to you. Your brain actually starts to um, uh, lock off, if you like, or cut off all these synapses, that these, these pathways, these neural pathways that are not necessary. That's why a 16-year-old feels everything about everything. Everything is monumentally important mm. and there are so many things they care about and you don't care enough about this and you can't care enough about that and why are you so p passive about the world and this and that and the other and it must be that way it must be that way because they're they're learning about caring and they're learning about the world and they're... but once you get to go this is what i can do and this is how many problems there are in the world so i better just do this as best I can, because if I start doing that, I'm not going to do anything. Mm. And I've learnt that because now I'm middle-aged. And that's the honing down. And it's not a bad thing to go, I, I'm going to go and buy that shirt because I need a good shirt because I'm going to go for an interview or I'm going to go to that party and I want to feel good in that party and it's important that I do. It's like honing down. I mean, and, and it does sound selfish, but it's absolutely what we should do because otherwise we exhaust ourselves. It's so interesting that I mean, I, I know that you said, and I'm sure you could have chosen other poems from the collection and, I, and that it's the poet, but I'd love it that it is 5 a.m. that you chose because, it, you, you know, when you were talking about that time of the morning and being available yeah. to those kinds of thoughts and that vulnerability. You know, I live such a life of restriction as a Christian. I was a proper, full-on, born-again Christian at about 28. Full conversion, talking in tongues, proper. I was a little Catholic boy, so I didn't know anything about that weird side. I went fully into it. I read the Bible three times. I studied it. I was into it for about 20 years. Yeah. And the conscience that kept on knocking on my door was, you're not free, you're not free, you're not free, somehow you're not free. Because these boundaries kept coming up. You can't do that. Oh, you can't say that. You can't must Lots of rules wow. in the sort of Victorian idea of Christianity that we have. And I kept bursting out of them, little bursts when I left home, you know, to work. Little bursts of some other guy would pop out. I'd go, who is that? Is that me or is it that guy who's really good at keeping the straight and narrow, who does the right things? And that exploded about two in the bit, two and a half years ago and I got uh, separated and then divorced. And I don't think that, I don't celebrate divorce. I don't think divorce is the greatest thing that ever happens to everybody. I, I don't, I'm not that school. No. And I miss my son. I don't see him as much as I should. You know, yeah. But I'm telling you, the freedom that I got from that, when I eventually learned how to deal with the freedom, because I had too much of it, <laughs> the freedom that I learned to, to deal with is the best thing I've ever had in my life. The sense of saying yes. Because I've been saying no, no, no to lots of things can't do that job because it's, it's, it's there's something sinful about it can't be with these people because they're doing sinful things uh, I can't uh, know that person I can't bring that person home I can't open myself to this situation because just in case suddenly going I'm going to say for two years I did this I'm going to say yes to everything and some of the situations when I think about it I'm like I don't know how you got out of that but you did <laughs> Like sort of a holy fool, you walk through fire and you didn't get burnt. I don't know how, but you didn't. Mm. And here I am, feeling very, you know, um, sort of healthy and sane, neither euphoric nor kind of down on myself, like pretty even keeled. And that's come about through going, yes, 
And that's the 5 a.m. feeling, is that everything's yes, and nothing's yet has become, you know, you can't think that. You can, everything's available at that time mm. of the morning. You're not responsible in some ways mm. for your destiny mm. or for what you think mm. or for what you're dwelling on or for what passes through, in that way that meditation's meant to be. It just passes you by. And those images are just images that are coming at this person, just coming at the poet or the character, if you like, that the poem, the poet uh, is depicting. It's just images and things. And then the stray thought of something really practical like that guy next to me or that woman next to me who's got fleas from that cat. And then back to the images in the room. That's wonderful to me because that's her saying, I will think about that. She's not saying, I can't think about him next to me. It doesn't become tense. Mm. It's just, a, it's like the croissant. Mm. It's like the guy. Mm. It's like the moon. It's like having the breakfast later or going to sleep. Everything's even, everything's even. But somehow, because we think about the poem, when we read it, we've got time, we see the big thing coming out. Like, mm. That's going to that's be in bold now. Mm. From reading that poem, the, the opening two lines... To have the nerve to go for that as your opening two lines. Yeah. Well, I just read the opening two. It's not quite like, am I getting old? Old people wake early. I mean, straight in. Yeah, there's something. You know, obviously, it's mer- to, to it's, micro to macro. Yeah. You know, to to you know, time of day, death, mm. yeah. self. That's a that's a that's. Going straight in. Yeah, and this and this sort of future hope as well, where she goes, half a croissant on the desk, it's like a squashed crescent. That's quite melancholy too. And then she says, <laughs> oh, and there's, there's the record I bought with a Soviet rocket sleeve. There's that hope for the future. You know, I bought something, it's going to be nice, you know. And my brother used to put his new shoes on the table and we'd wake up every morning, or we'd make up the morning after he'd bought them. I used to think it was bloody weird. But he did, and it, obviously it was him like going, today I can wear these special shoes. Like the future is gonna be great, the future's mm. great. Mm. And she doesn't get around to saying, oh actually, I'm not really gonna be able to play that because I don't have a record player. She doesn't say that till later, but the hope, she sort of gives herself, after all this sort of melancholy, she sort of gives herself, oh well that's a good thing to look forward to later. I'll have to go and have a go at that, you know? I, I love the juxtaposition she has with, the, as you said, the mundane. I wonder if I care about the right things. She's profound thinking, like rabbits dying slowly in Brexit. And then she reiterates what we think. Sometimes I'm secretly unfazed because we think Brexit, we don't really care anymore, it's happening. I feel selfish and middle-aged. And this girl, she's not even 30. Really? She's yeah. not 30. Really? I know, the wisdom that's yeah. in there is yeah. pretty amazing, that's isn't it? Yeah, and she do, I'm telling you, she does not, as a person, this is, I think, why I needed a poet to introduce her to poetry. She don't carry that around with her. Mm. Do you know, she carries, a, there's a lightness to her. And I almost think that's the modern way. Like, I don't mm. think uh, young people, certainly not that generation, mm. do uh, obvious profundity. I think they feel a little bit unsure about it. Yeah. Like, they feel unsure about a lot of things, but they feel a little bit wary of it they know what's deep they know what touches them but they don't really want it in their face at all yeah i'm interested to know having discovered a poet that really speaks to you Hmm. and that you go totally get it and you make that noise that i won't attempt (laughs) does has that um kind of meant that you've started to go maybe i'll have a look at that other poet revisit one that I couldn't get hold of are there, are there any others that you've discovered or met um, n- I mean it would be it would be about retracing my steps um, because I'm very as you can tell quite verbose I'm a lover of words and uh, that's another reason why poetry didn't I didn't get poetry because it's too distilled the thoughts are too, were, were too distilled, I think, for the most part. And the poems, the poets that I was attracted to were Pushkin and Wordsworth when I was a teenager. I don't think you can get two poets who are, who are more verbose and who really love the sounds, if you like, of their own words. Mm-hmm. 
And, and the I'm, long poem. Yeah, and, and, and the long poem. Oh, I love the long poem. Lover po- of the long poem. Oh, I really love a long poem. A terrible lover That's of great. the long poem. Yeah, I mean, Eugene Onegin, I uh, picked up at, uh, at the library and I picked it up and I started reading it about 11 o'clock one night and it was dawn by the time I uh, finished it. Mm. Uh, and I was crying and it was just beautiful. The Penguin edition, I still see it now, the hardback Penguin edition, which I, I, I'm almost doubting I ever gave back. Um, <laughs> but, and I used to hide out in the library, by the way, at school. And that's, I didn't go to school very much after I was about 13, 14, 14 maybe, uh, 13 and a bit. I used to bunk off and go to the Wilson Green Library and just hide out in there. Um, and just read, read shit, just read stuff. And then I'd read some more Passant or some Oscar Wilde and then I'd read crap and then, so there's nothing. But I loved, I drank it in like it was life's blood. I'd walk the streets of Wilsdon and Cricklewood and uh, Kilburn and I would be reading, like people do with their phone now. Mm. Like some little mad kid. I mean, I think about the image of this kid, you know, smoking and reading my book. I used to walk to Brent Cross from Wilston High Road. It's <laughs> reading my book. Loved it. Loved the. I escaped from school. But words, it was all about words. So Wordsworth, you know, I used to memorise bits of Wordsworth for just myself. Um, but they were, they, were, they were words that none of my contemporaries, nobody in my world would say, and I'd never say them to anybody aloud. You know, in a throng, a festal company of maids and youth, Old men and matrons stayed. I mean, who was this guy? You know, this Wilson Green quail guy. But that's, I loved all that. Wow. I was obsessed with it. I'd learn whole swathes of Shakespeare after that. Words, lots of them. Couldn't get enough. Couldn't get enough. So that's why poetry made, made me slightly twitch, because it's like, there's only three words in this poem, or it's a haiku, or yeah. I, it's yeah. so short. I don't know what this means. Mm. And it just made me feel like I was stupid. Mm. We always ask, and we haven't asked you yet, um, what kind of a friend Mm. would you consider this poem to be? Mm. I would consider this poem to be a truthful friend. Doesn't sell me flowers, is not trying to paint the world in any other way than it is. But at the same time, it's not saying to me that life is without hope. It's not bleak. But at the same time, it's very honest. This is how we do as human beings. This is how we do. Uh, And there's a comfort in it. There's a mm mm-hmm in it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. 5am. It's not quite light. Am I getting old? Old people wake early. Half a croissant's on the desk, like a squashed crescent. And there's that record I bought with the Soviet rocket sleeve. Around the corner in Highbury, Keith's cat has given you fleas. Your bags are packed for Antibes. I wonder if I care about the right things, like rabbits dying slowly and Brexit. Sometimes I'm secretly unfazed. I feel selfish and middle-aged. I'd like to play this rocket record, but I don't have a record player. The band are from Leeds. Is that cool? I can't work out if this is regret or just the onset of dullness. I think I'll eat breakfast, then sleep till noon. Eat the remains of last night's moon. That was Michael with the reading of 5am by Roxy Dunn 
And our thanks to Roxy and to Patterson. If you want to read more of Roxy's poems, 5am is from a collection called Clowning, which is available from Eyewear Publishing. Patterson has a new book coming out in 2018. It's called Julius Caesar and Me, and it's published by Bloomsbury, and it's available for pre-ordering. Thanks again to the October Gallery for hosting us. Details of everything we've been speaking about can be found on the description page. So wherever you are, whenever you find yourself listening to this episode, wishing you a happy Poetry Day, and thank you for listening. <laughs>